everybody and welcome to another edition of tunnel vision a show brought to you by uscfootball.com i'm your host keely or joined by shotgun spratling and ryan abraham we have a lot to talk about today first off usc has a new athletic director mike bone was introduced by president carol fult today at the presser we all were there so we'll get our thoughts and reactions to that and what that means for this usc athletic department and the football program specifically i will also be previewing usc's matchup on the road against arizona state Will the Trojans be able to handle a tough Sun Devil team? Will they awaken out of their, their two games lo losing streak, I believe, Ryan? Yes? ASU, yeah, yes. two game losing streak. Then they had a bye week, so they got some time to they lick their wounds. Time. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We'll, we'll, so we'll talk about that. Of course, uh, the future of SC football and Clay Helton. I know everyone was asking about that on Twitter and whatnot, so we'll get to that. There was? I, people were talking about that? Oh. Maybe, maybe. Okay. People are, it's interesting. People have really uh, uh, become more engaged on Twitter now that there's an the athletic Whoa. director. Things are things are happening. The train is rolling, I believe. Uh, so we'll talk about that. Uh, and Ryan, you wrote an article. We'll get to that in, in a yeah, second. Yeah, uh, it's pretty yeah. popular today. It was good. Yeah, it, yeah we'll, we'll get into that. But it was like timing was dropped, like for for a specific reason. True. You know, maybe a few hours before the press conference. So you no. might have mentioned a name, uh, a UM. An yeah. Urban Meyer, yes. Maybe. He maybe dropped the UM bomb. Yeah. Uh, but we'll, we'll talk about that. Uh, as always, you can call us for some free live therapy. A 5124 tunnel. Call us throughout the show. We love talking to you guys. And tweet at us. Hashtag tunnel vision. I'll put your tweet up on the screen. And as always, wherever you're watching, I believe we are live on all three platforms, YouTube, Facebook, and Periscope. Put your comments, questions, concerns, and we'll be sure to answer them. Uh, so thanks so much for watching, guys. But first up, let's talk about Mike Bone, USC's newest athletic director. First off, guys, what was your first impressions? I know he said he's a very passionate, energetic man, and I think you got that from the press conference. Yeah, if you check out some of his YouTube stuff from the University of Cincinnati, like that was interesting, I thought. But... The one thing, so there, he won the press conference. He did a really good job. He showed energy. If you go back and watch the Lin Swan press conference and then watch this one, it's like they weren't even doing the same job, which, you know, that's the thing. The one thing I felt, though, and, you know, shotgun, I didn't get where Mike Bone played, what position he played at USC. So he never mentioned that in the press conference. So what, was he a safety? I don't know. What did you think he played football at USC? He played at Kansas, actually. He also played baseball at Kansas. Oh. So he got... So wait, USC hired someone that wasn't a football player Ex at USC? Ryan, hold on, Ryan. What were your two requirements for the next athletic director? Okay. They have to have been an athletic director before. Yes. And they can't know the fight song. Well, he said today he's loved the USC fight song since he was a kid. Yes. And had it on his playlist. So he knew the fight song, what? Ryan. Now, uh -oh. I don't know uh -oh. if I, uh -oh. I don't know uh -oh. if I, I don't know if I believe Mike Bone on that one. But <laughs> are you kidding? He said fight on, fight on to victory. He he was like he singing it. it he didn't sing it. He was just saying it. He was it. basically singing it. It sounded up, yeah. a little awkward. It's good that he's aware <laughs> of the fight song. It's not you know he mm. didn't he didn't walk mm, out of the tunnel like, with the fight song playing. He uh, was he was singing it all morning after he, or singing it all yesterday whenever the contract was actually signed because uh, he was singing it well knowing that there's a lot of dollar bills coming behind that as well. Yeah, I think I mean it's a nice I thought he's done a nice job at the University of Cincinnati. Um, they did some really good things. You know, Dan Weber was a little skeptical. He's a Cincinnati guy, a little skeptical. And I uh, really loved them after being able to talk with them. They had some Cincinnati connections. They talked about that. I, you know, just having, and we talked about this before, just having someone with those basic requirements that they weren't in the USC family and they have been an athletic director before and he's done it for a long time. That's going to be such a, a move up. And I know he met with the entire athletic department staff afterwards. We were talking with some of the staff members. They were looking forward. Some of them hadn't even met him yet. He hadn't met Clay Helton yet. And they've, yeah. they've met since then. Um, but, you know, talking to some of the athletic staffers, I think they were excited. There's good people that work in the USC athletic department, and they've had poor leadership for years. And I think for them, 
it just you know talking to them off the record just they felt different they felt like yeah. hey this someone's coming in with a real direction of where this athletic department's going to go and even if he's not the greatest athletic director in the world he might be awesome but he's going to be so much better than what USC's had yeah that yeah you could tell that there it was a new vibe it was a new era yeah. in that sense like when you hire someone to do the job that you know you're hiring them to do it's like it changes the game you know when you hire uh, you know, a short order cook to be your surgeon. Like, there's going to be some. What, that, I'm not sure about this. You know, he's got a spatula or whatever. He doesn't have a, a scalpel. But you're you're getting an athletic director. He has a plan. He's bringing it in, and he's going to implement it at USC. And they just haven't had that for the last 25 years. And the thing that comes with experience, and I was talking to Shockin about this on the Family Feud podcast. Plug. plug. Uh, he. He had a lot of experience with the press. You could tell that he knew how to work a room. He knew how to interact with m media members. And that always goes a long way. You want positive press, especially for USC and the, the tumultuous, that's the word, uh, uh, past that they've had. I, I don't know what word that is. <laughs> yes, that one, that one. Uh, <laughs> given that the past that they've had, you want someone who is friendly with the media and knows what they're doing. I know I sound biased because I am the media, but he was able to work the room really well. He, he was good, and if you remember, and, and you know, some people, we get Mike Garrett lumped in there. He did at least work in the athletic department. He was there for a long time. There, he did some good things. He did some bad things. He was pretty terrible as far as public speaking goes. That definitely wasn't his strong suit. Pat Hayden was smooth, silky smooth, but just kind of like this arrogance. So he was actually better with the media, and then Lin Swan was terrible with it. He didn't like talking to anybody. I don't know what, what he was even doing there. But all of the, everyone, they had their deficiencies. But you look like a guy, a guy like Mike Bone. He's really good with the media, but he's out, you know, uh, tweeting pictures with the Trojan marching band and all this stuff. He looks like he wants to be there. He's excited. He's definitely excited for the student athletes. He wasn't getting getting into uh, talking about the future of the football program. It's too early for that. He just got there, which you know completely makes sense. But he looks like an athletic director, and that's just something that USC hasn't had for a long time. Definitely. Shotgun, any thoughts? What were your what were your what or what were your initial reactions? You, you know the the talk of togetherness and making decisions. Like it's going to be, it's not just going to be him making a decision. So I think that goes to whenever they're hiring and firings, he, it's going to be a group thing. But also the togetherness of t stalk, the, talking about twenty one. Tell us, it's been a long day. We've guys. been talking for hours, yeah, guys. Yeah. We've recorded many shows today. Um, okay. But that the 21 sports at USC, that all of them are, are going to matter, not just the football program. And I know everyone on here is want to talk about the football program. However, there are a lot of good athletes that have come through USC and that deserve that the athletic director cares about them as well, which didn't always seem to be the case when you hire three straight football players. You know, you you, sit, you tell the rest of the, you know, c community campus that, you know, football is king, football is what, what matters. And some of the hires and fires that have gone on, you kind of told that as well, where it sounds like Mike Bone and, you know, they kind of championed some of the things he had done at UC with some of the other programs. He was going to the volleyball game tonight. Uh, you know, he definitely sh gave the passion and energy uh, that he said that he had. So that was very evident. You know, he was, like Keely said, was working the room really well, said, hey, come up to me and see me on campus or, you know, at the volleyball game, whatever it may be. I thought he did really good with that. Talking about recruiting even yeah. in it and that they want to win recruiting. They said they want to do every – they want to win basically everything. Yeah. All every 21 aspect. sports, you know, they want to win in recruiting. National championships, championships for everything. That's what he talked about a lot. And that should be the goal, right, of an yeah. athletic director? Yeah. Because that didn't seem like it was always the goal of some of the previous athletic directors. So I, I think that he, you know, got off to a great start. Like you said, he won the press conference. And, you know, it's just now do you follow it up? You know, can you follow it up? Keeley brought this up earlier. You know, Clay Helton won the press conference too, his first one. I, I It reminded me a lot of Clay Helton's introductory press conference where he said the right things. He came out really hot. Uh, saying like blue bread program, bringing back the glory days, you know, all that good stuff. Power but, football. I think he talked about power football. And yeah, the, and, yeah. And alumni got excited about that, and then they were, that was never to be found. Yeah. yeah. So, so it it seemed like like that press conference. All the right things were said. It hit the right tone. It won over everyone in the room. But can you follow up on what you said? So I think the jury's still out in that sense. But so far, so good for Mike Bone. Uh, we got real quick on Periscope. Sure. It's T P I S. -E. L E one. Amazing that we are celebrating an athletic director at USC because we have not had a real one for years. Let's go. And that, I mean, that's true. It's sort of like 
uh, you know, you tie your shoes in the morning and someone's like giving you an award. You're like, it, it should be really simple to tie your shoes. USC hasn't done the really simple thing. So this is a huge step. And I thought when Careful came in, you know, you would have liked to, you know, Lynn Swan had been gone a little faster than he was, but yeah, she took care of business. They now have their athletic director in place. It sounds like, you know, they looked at some different people and once they dug down deep on, on Mike Bone, they really liked what they saw there. They really liked what, what he brought to the table. This is the right step. Now having a real athletic director in place, which we haven't had for decades, now, now you can let this athletic department grow and, you know, be changed. They're going to make some purges. There's going to, you know, there's going to be a lot of stuff going on there. Yeah. One of the things that stood out to me was that he catered to pretty much everyone to an extent. You know, he talked about how they wanted to connect with the, you know, he wanted to connect with the student athletes and stuff. He talked about how he wanted to uh, connect with the former players and, and, you know, former athletes. You know, he wanted to, he said, one of the things he said was his top priority was to listen, learn, and then lead. In that oh, order. Yeah, listen, learn, lead. Yeah. Uh, so he wanted to go through the the process. Sorry for having technical, you know, audio difficulties over there. It's buzzing in my ears, at least. Um, but you know, he catered to those people. He also said that you know he he wants to you know meet with the boosters, you know, type of thing. You know, he brought everyone kind of in, and it felt like you, the response from the the people that work at USC and then kind of the outsiders hearing from other people was that you know, that. Everything sounded positive, and everyone felt like they were kind of touched by his message. You yeah. know that that he had reached out and extended, you know that uh, extended a welcome to everyone. That he was going to be open and willing to listen to everyone's conversation and stuff too. So I thought that he did a really good job of catering kind of everyone that way. Real quick, hey, Keely, I think it might just be the phones. If you want to play with the little phone jack over okay, here, so I, we'll I think, do. Let, let us know if the are we are you hearing us okay? Are it you sounds getting a little low to me? No, I think it's I think it's our headphones. Okay. I don't think the the microphone signal going out is low. My okay. guess, but let yeah. us know if that's the case. Uh, that obviously he was asked many questions about USC's football program, the future of Clay Helton, mm -hmm. the expectations for this team. Uh, pretty much every answer was it's too premature. For premature, me to say. premature. Premature was the word. It's premature for for me to say anything at this point. He did say though, uh, good football teams finish strong, and that he's looking for the team to finish strong. He was like, I don't want to add any more pressure to the coaches or the players, but that's what I'm looking for. Uh, and uh, Carol Folt was asked if she, if she gave any limitations uh, to uh, Mike Bone on his uh, hiring ability, his coaching hires, and she said no, which everyone on Twitter got very excited about. Um, <laughs> but it looks like... It's uh, almost like you can't trust everything certain people say. True. Maybe. I mean, I mean we'll, what is, but okay, what is she supposed to say in that instance? No, I'm not talking about her. I'm talking about previous reports. There was a lot of reports. Uh, I'm just going saying. On. I'm just saying. But to be fair, like Mike Bone did say, he does not. He's not going to make this autonomous decision. Mm -hmm. You know, he's yeah. going to. It's going to be more of a collaborative effort. Uh, Rick Caruso was there, the billionaire that does the Grove. I mean, he's the Americana, the head Americana. of the the board of trustees. So he was there. He, oh, he he like thanked him. Like he, he thanked him. He yeah. almost groveled at at Rick you know, Caruso's feet there. If a billionaire's like that, hiring that me for one something, I'm going to thank out him. To me a little bit too. Yeah, there was a little bit of that. He yeah. said he's that that he's blessed that he's there, or that USC's blessed that Rick Caruso. It's, he's a blessing. Yeah. Yeah, blessing. That's right. what it was. So that was that was kind of an interesting point. Um, like Keely said, the the talk about football was I haven't even met with the coaches yet. It's a little premature, but he did say you know wins are important and it's fight on to victory. So yeah. you know he said so yes you know wins are important there. Um, so that was something that that kind of stood out as well. Yeah, and that, you know the funny thing was that uh, yeah Keely like that's nice. Um, <laughs> sorry, we have a little technical behind the scenes stuff going on. The fact that your athletic director being introduced and you know there was rumors of him being hired for almost a week uh the reports came out i think on last friday or something hadn't met with the current football head coach uh i mean before the press conference that seems a little strange right like and if you remember clay helton was there with his wife for lynn swan's presser yeah you know, Clay Hilton has actually survived. This is his third athletic director at it's USC. Crazy. How crazy is that? Like, your interim head coach, this is his third athletic director. A um, little nuts. But, yes, this is uh, – I mean, I, you're going to read any of the tea leaves into it? You know, we none of us think that Clay Hilton's long for this job. But, you know, it's going to be – most likely it's going to be over within the next few weeks. But 
the fact that they hadn't met yet is uh, kind of interesting. And he did say, because we asked about it, and he said, well, I've talked a lot about Clay Helton, but I look forward to meeting him. So it's like, oh, you talked a lot about him? Yeah. Like, what were those conversations? See, I thought, I thought the way he worded that he was referencing the press conference because everyone was asking football questions about Clay Helton's future. Maybe. So it, Maybe. You know, it could be interpreted a little bit different ways there. Uh, Clay Helton did say that he stopped by when Clay Helton talked today, this afternoon. Mike Bone stopped by. Yeah, Mike Bone stopped by his office. You know, basically just kind of a meet and greet and that it was positive. That was what Clay said uh, in his presser today. So yeah. yeah, and speaking of reading the tea leaves, we actually have a tweet uh, from Mateo Allen who says, Our new AD obviously couldn't outright say he was going to fire Clay Helton in his press conference, but were there any statements he made where you could read between the lines or that were maybe meant to send a message to fans? Interesting. Well, I mean, I'm not saying he couldn't. Like, they could have. Like, there were plenty of people trying to read into everything that was said. Yeah. Yeah. You know, how many times that Carol Folt said the word integrity? You know, is that, a, is that an Urban Meyer? Clue? Yeah. Does that mean is not that, Urban Meyer? Is that, yeah. per, you know, or is that a president talking about a university? That's usually one of the words that is used in there. Yeah. I would say that he didn't come out and fully support, I mean, saying they were supporting the team and the student athletes. And the fact that he hadn't met with them yet, I think if, if you were the new athletic director and it was, uh, you know, you're at Washington and Chris Peterson's the head coach, that's the first guy I'm talking to. I, I mean, I, I don't think you had to, Clay Helton didn't have to be the first guy that he would talk to. But if otherwise, I mean, obviously like an Alabama or something, but, you know, if you're the Utah, if Utah gets a new athletic director, Kyle Whittingham's the first dude I'm talking to. I don't, I, it's not like he was in Heritage Hall because I, you know, I, when I walked up, you know, it was Caruso and Carol Folt and Dave Roberts, the interim AD, and Bone all walking in a procession towards um, towards the McKay Center where uh, the press conference was. So it's not like they were in the McKay Center where the coaches' offices and stuff were, and he was just kind of walking around meeting everybody beforehand. Yeah. So, I, but you got to go out of your way. Like as soon as you get off the plane, I'm meeting the head coach. Like that's the first thing I'd want to do or, if, if you know he's going to be around. You or know, if it's like an established head coach. When when did he get in? You know, is the paperwork done? Because I think the paperwork's the first thing. I There's would a be lot doing. of variables it's, that I don't know. We can like really I don't nail think, that down. See, and that's and that's the thing. Like, could you read into these things? Yeah. Yes, you could read totally. into them, but I I think it's just. Like he said, I think he's a little premature to read into it. Uh, you know, the the future after a 56-24 loss to Oregon where basically the team quit in the second half. Yeah. Um, I, I think that tells you a lot more about the future for Clay Hilton than necessarily any specific statement that was made in this in this press conference. Yeah. He did say he watched the game. He did? Yeah. He did on say TV. he watched the game on TV. So that – that's hey, probably not good. Yeah. It, it's not, you know, maybe you can gloss over it if you, you weren't sitting there watching going, ugh, that yeah. does not look like a good product. But I don't think you have to read into this much. You've already read the last chapter of the story. You know how it ends. So, um, you know, Do we? you can move on. We know how it ends. You could have said that last season, too. We, we know how this one ends. <laughs> this, this is, yes. There's, well, yeah. That sense, We're going on a long vacation if it doesn't end the way we think it's going to end. <laughs> oh, well, that makes me want a long vacation. <laughs> but <laughs> Always good for that, Ryan. True. Yeah. <laughs> on that sense, uh, on that note, Ryan, you wrote an article this morning. I did. Oh, yes. You, uh, that dropped. Uh, tell the people what you wrote. Right. Uh, that USC needs to hire uh, one Urban Meyer. And Chuck and I actually disagree on some of the reasons. Uh, so you can check out the, the piece out on uscfootball.com. It's uh, been very popular. I dropped it this morning at like 7.30 or so, a few hours before the press conference. And we're hearing mixed reviews about if USC would hire him or if they would not. And, you know, we don't really know for sure. There's certainly ties from Mike Bone uh, at the University of Cincinnati to Urban Meyer. Uh, his sister is on the, I think the vice president like the board of trustees or something like that. She's a vice provost or something. And Urban Meyer's son is on the baseball team at the University of Cincinnati. They tweeted at each other and stuff. So there's there's some connections there. But he, to me, is the, the one guy that could fix the mess that is the USC football team and the culture. I definitely go listen to Move the Sticks podcast uh, with Daniel Jeremiah and Bucky Brooks. Uh, they, they do a great, I've known those guys for years. Daniel Jeremiah is a member of the Peristyle. He's on our message board. Shout Re out to DJ. Yeah, DJ's awesome with that. They had a 30-minute conversation with Urban Meyer, and it sounds like he has a PhD in football culture. You would, listening to him and whoever's been running the USC programs for the last 10 years, it's night and day. You just can't even imagine that they 
do the same job as their football coaches because he's so much better at everybody else that you've heard from USC. USC has made so many critical mistakes at the leadership positions from the top of the, the food chain and the athletic department and the football, the football team. The only way for, to fix this in one fell swoop is to hire Urban Meyer. I think it's a, the right step today to bring in a real athletic director. I think there's some really good coaching candidates out there, and USC's probably going to go after them instead of hiring someone that's familiar, that's not really good, someone that is desired. I think USC is going to get someone that's desired this time around, which is a huge step, but there's an opportunity of a lifetime to have Urban Meyer, who's in your backyard working for Fox, come in, and he would instantaneously fix the football program. And there, there's no other person that could do it as fast as Urban Meyer. So that, to me, I mean, read the story. I hope you guys enjoy it. But that's, uh, that's my take on the situation. It'll be interesting for sure. We're kind of breaking our tunnel vision rule. We don't talk about hypotheticals if there's not an opening. That's the biggest reason we disagree on Urban Meyer, because there's no coach opening as of yet. So no. I, I don't talk about it. And that's the biggest thing that has been interesting to me, seeing how kind of the the tide has really changed in this last week. You know, first the blowout lost to Oregon. It just kind of looked like the writing was on the wall for Clay Helton. And then the AD is announced that's in place. That's kind of like the last domino in, in, in line. It just seems like we're in a different era right now where we, nothing really can happen on the field to, to kind of save what's, what's happening in this Clay Helton era. Yeah, I mean, if you remember two years ago, USC went to Arizona State after getting uh, walloped by Notre Dame and, uh, you know, beat the crap out of ASU on the road. We were, I think we were all at that game. And um, it was like a Porter, was that the Porter Gustin? Like, I think he, yes, when he came back and he, played way too much unnecessarily. Right, yeah. Uh, but USC went on and won the, uh, the Pac 12 that year. I'm, I, I'm curious to see what the morale of this team is going to be. Yeah. I think there could be a little bit of boost by getting a guy like uh, Mike Bowen in there. But USC did give up in the second half of that Oregon game. You knew it was over as soon as that kickoff return for a touchdown, 20 seconds left in the first half. We hadn't seen that all year. I mean, they'd fought hard all year, but it seemed like the beginning of that. The writing was on the wall at that point. What are they going to do going into ASU? They're going to get some guys back from injury. So I think there's some potential that the, the, the morale could be back up. But you get the sense that the, the first sign of some kind of adversity, are they going to be able to fight back? through it so i'm curious to see if, if usc blows them out i mean I, i'm you know i, I don't, wouldn't be shocked but i kind of think usc is probably going to lose a close one but that's previews for later but i guess <laughs> I, but yeah spoiler alert but i guess i was talking ryan about the program as a whole because before the Oregon loss we were talking about usc controls their own destiny could clay hilton lead this Ugh. team back to a pactual championship and now we're not even talking that's not even in the realm of possibilities right now as far as where this team feels like it's headed it just seems like we're in a different territory now i guess was my point yeah no, and i think that was a reach then to talk about control your own destiny stuff like you, you wanted to beat Notre Dame like there's important things on the schedule and it was I think they they were hanging their hat on hey we could win the Pac-12 South and they put so much focus on that and you just weren't setting the bar uh very high so now that you don't control your own destiny we're hearing them talk about well they got to make a run and win the last three games and hope that Utah stubs their toe but you're still like that's not I mean you're five and four you were you were five and seven last year like that's that's what's wrong with the program. You know, yes, you might back into the Pac-12 championship game somehow. That's not what's important. You got to look and play. You got to play Georgia football, and they're not been doing that. I think that's what's important. So, it, it, yeah, you feel like some of the shine has come off this, and it just doesn't seem like there's as much to play for. At least they were kind of hanging on to the control your own destiny stuff, even though you don't agree with it. But they're not hanging on to that anymore. Yeah, you know, Utah goes to Washington, gets a big win there. You know, rallies late in that one. And so USC knows going into the Oregon game, there's pressure on us. We got to play well. And, you know, once things, once hurdles started happening, they just started running into those hurdles. <laughs> Instead of jumping over them, they're just plowing through them. Uh, and they weren't doing it like Terry Tate or anything. They weren't going oh. through through the walls, the <laughs> office linebacker. No, they're just falling over at, at the hurdles and stuff. You know, the, the turnovers have killed USC. That's going to be a big thing this weekend again because Arizona State's another team. Oregon was really, really good at – causing turnovers, having turnover, really great turnover margin. Well, when you get an NFL coach like Herm Edwards, he's going to emphasize and focus that, which shows you what can happen when that is such an emphasis and a focus. And wasn't that what Clay Hilton's offseason mantra was, that he was going to focus on the turnovers and penalties? And, and USC's terrible at both. Yeah. 
Are that last is USC last in the Pac-12 in penalties? No, obviously. I don't know if they're last. They're down there. They're they're one of the worst five in the country. But <laughs> but knowing the Pac-12 refs, there could be multiple Pac-12 teams down there. Right. Um, but but the worst in the Pac-12 in turnover margin. So the the and, things that your head coach said they were going to focus on. But the thing that Clay Helton will say if we had him on the show is that they've only had two uh, turnovers with non quarterbacks. So the Corbin uh, the, the Quincy Gentry fumble. And then there was one more. I Bayless think the Jones. Jones. Yeah, yeah on a kickoff but, return. And then he kind of chalks it up to these are inexperienced quarterbacks who are making poor decisions rather than, hey, oh, everyone's yeah. having loose uh, ball control. Yeah, quarterback turnovers don't count. I didn't realize that. They Just count. like rushing yards for opposing <laughs> quarterbacks don't count. Yeah, true. Like Justin Herbert running for that touchdown. Yeah, that doesn't count because he doesn't normally <laughs> run. Speaking of which, mobile quarterbacks, USC is facing another one. Mm -hmm. Ooh, uh, Jaden Daniels. Jaden Daniels. Uh, and so that, prospect. that's one thing that you could say, well, it's a freshman quarterback, but you look over at Arizona State and Jane Daniels has taken care of the ball. Yeah. You know, so there's a lot of excuses that can be built in for this USC team, but then you can look at other programs and particularly this ASU one, because there's a lot of similarities there to some of the things that, you know, were bothering ASU the previous years before Herm Edwards, you know, they've got a freshman quarterback this year as well. He's playing really well. He's led them on late game comebacks and stuff and USC's freshman quarterback has been a freshman at time and now the offensive line hasn't helped him at times but he's got a dynamic receiver core which Arizona State does not have as good of, of no. one you know they don't have Nikhil Harry there anymore so you know they've got a great running back and you know Benjamin and USC's been hurt by it but all those are kind of factors in there but you can compare those two programs and say they take care of the ball and they're in every game now, they're definitely not as talented as USC. So that's why maybe they're not winning as many of those close games. Or, you know, But they're going through Herm Edwards' style, keeping the game close, try to win it late, and they've done a pretty good job of that, even though they have less talent on their roster than USC does. Yeah, For true freshman quarterback, a way worse offensive line that's banged up, and you got a bunch of freshmen on there. Nowhere near as good receivers. They have one feature back. They have Eno Benjamin, and you know they just run him to death. But that's what you got. And they... Two interceptions on the year for Jaden Daniels. Like, USC quarterbacks have had three different three interception games this year, and one of them wasn't from a true freshman. Yes. Uh, in case you're wondering, Including USC is yeah. 12th in penalties, 655 yards. 12th of how many teams are in the Pac 12? 12. Oh, so that would be carry the two. Last? Okay, yes. Yes, 6.8. Oh, wait, there, there's actually a number in the name, and it's the same. What's going on with the Big Ten, then? Why are there 47 teams in the Big Ten? Yeah, doesn't make sense there. Uh, before we get too much into the ASU talk, I'm actually going to go to our live callers, because I have a feeling they want to talk about the athletic director and potential coaches, maybe. Uh, so let's go to our first caller. Hello, you're live on Tunnel Vision. Hey, Ryan, JD from DC. Got JD, a for what's you. up, bro? Uh, got a question for you. I totally subscribe to what you said today in your post, and I think Shotgun has exactly the right take on what happened at the pressure today. But I think people are, are getting a little too far over their skis with the renewed enthusiasm that Urban Meyer might be coming. And I'll tell you why. Carol Folt and Baum could be totally in alignment for a reason that I just haven't heard people talking about a great deal. Urban Meyer got into trouble at Ohio State, not necessarily and not exclusively because of the Me Too phenomenon. He got into an epic and existential fight with Mike Drake, the president, because he was dissembling to him. And he has a history of this. Now, put yourself in Carol Folt's shoes. And remember, nobody, I'd like to see Urban Meyer here as much as anybody. But if she did her diligence, the first thing she did is called up the presidents, her peers, at these various schools that he's been head coach at. And she probably got an earful from uh, Mike Drake. And, you know, if you were in her shoes, or for that matter, Mike Vaughn's shoes, would you really want a guy underneath you who has a history of dissembling to his managers? In other words, you know, as much as you'd like to see USC return to greatness in football, you know, any CEO would never put themselves in a position where they could not trust what their reports are saying to them. And remember, too, what Mike Bowen learned at Colorado, he learned how to manage up. 
That's why he failed at Colorado. It wasn't just his lousy record and stuff. He didn't have a good relationship at the end with the president, and he learned that lesson. He had an exemplary relationship with the president of Cincinnati. Thanks, J.D., for the, the call there. So I think when you're talking about a football coach, technically they are below. There's like the CEO or the CFO or whatever. Like there's a, there's a hierarchy there. If you look at Alabama, who's the most powerful person at Alabama? It's the, not the Greg state. Byrne. In the, yeah, I was going to say, it's, in the state of Alabama. It's not the president. It's He gets paid the most. It's Nick Saban. And you want to get a guy like Urban Meyer, you let him run his football program. You're not going to be like telling him how to do this or how to do that. You trust him to run it, and that's what you would have him do. Um, I'm not sure about the whole riff with the president. I mean, there was a whole lot of stuff kind of going on there. But USC is in a position now because of – so many years of horrible decisions, hiring people that were not qualified for the jobs that you're hiring. You've put yourself in this deep hole. To me, that's why you need to get a guy like Urban Meyer to come in and save you from all those bad decisions. It's not you, you, There's not a lot of opportunities when you can make 15 bad decisions in a row and then make one good one and make those other ones go away. You usually got to make a whole bunch in a row. This is one where you can make one good one and make most of those go away. I'm not touching it. <laughs> I just want to say that the alarm bells are going off in my head because I just have a warning of there's not an opening, there's not an opening, and we don't talk about hypotheticals. So for me, I talk about hypotheticals. I know you do, so you can, you I don't can care. totally take it. But thanks, JD, for the call. We appreciate it. Just a friendly reminder to the callers: uh, keep it short and yeah. have a question. That would be great. JD's kind of long-winded sometimes. <laughs> it happens. Uh, let's go to our next caller on the line. Hello, you're live on Tunnel Vision. Bobby in Los Angeles, first and foremost, I want to thank Shotgun for the great coverage so far this season on basketball. Thank you. Number two, I want to discuss Mike Bone. First of all, that didn't seem like a press conference to me. It seemed more like a pep rally. I wanted him to come in and sit there and say, football is our priority. 20 other sports get paid through football. Football is king. I wasn't impressed. I mean, the plus on uh, Mike Bone is he hired Fickle, who's beaten UCLA twice. But how in the heck can you guys get so excited? And I'm talking about the rest of the people. Uh, hiring John Embry has to be one of the most boneheaded mistakes I've ever seen an athletic director make. I don't, fi I don't find that going to Cincinnati to resurrect the USC football program so wonderful. I'm I'm very uh, very worried, and the best line I've ever seen on USCfootball.com is from Ryan Abraham throwing the hot helicopter for Urban Meyer. The great article, thank you. <laughs> Thanks, appreciate it. Um, yeah, so that was two jobs ago. I talked to people at Colorado, and actually, we were told after the uh, who was the first hire, the, um, Hawk, Dan, Hawkins, Dan Hawkins, that that the alumni wanted a. Colorado football player in there and the boosters wanted him in this. They forced John Embry on him. And uh, you, you could argue like if you're the athletic director and this was forced on you, you know, how powerful were you to begin with, whatever. But that's what I was told that it wasn't, he didn't want to hire John Embry. It was sort of a university decision and he kind of got stuck with it. And then uh, Mike McIntyre was pretty good. I mean, he won the Pac-12 South and he won it before Utah did. So and, that, and Colorado's not in that good of a shape, but that was two jobs ago. He's done really good things at Cincinnati. You know, I I don't know why you'd be down. Like, just being just being an athletic director is always is already way better than well, what USC has. Well, Lynn Swan and Pat Hayden never made mistakes like that. No, because they never did anything. Because they never made mistakes <laughs> before they got the USC job. We're referencing here. Yes, because they weren't athletic directors. And that's one of the things actually that Carol Fole and and uh, Bone actually talked up the, this during the press conference and their uh, scrums afterwards was they talked about the mistakes and Carol Folt was really uh, big into that. She says she's a scientist and, you know, scientists often get their best discoveries from making mistakes. And she wants someone that's willing to, to be experimental and, and try things out to an extent, uh, be innovative is the word she used, innovative and creative. And he also used both those words during his kind of his, pre-speech, uh, you know, before his, his opening speech, before he started taking questions. I do agree it did. It was a little bit like a pep rally. There were a lot of USC boosters and yeah. athletic, know, department athlete, athletic department. Athletic department. Like, and when he said he threw up the fight on, they were, oh, yeah. and I was like, what is going on? Yeah, I, was like, I thought it was a, doing that? I thought it was introductory press conference. I didn't no. know introductory pep rally. Well, all that, of those. That was a good point. The, the people that work under him were all there. They were meeting him for the first time afterwards. So, I mean, they all want to make sure they still have jobs too. So they were going to be excited. Boss man. And so a yeah. lot of people were there. They you had guys a, should learn from that. They had, <laughs> 
I knew that was coming. I knew that was coming. <laughs> they were having a meeting afterwards, which was kind of a meet and greet for a lot of people. So it wasn't Clay. Clay Helton wasn't the. Uh, it wasn't like he was the last employee on campus that wa- was going to meet him. So you yeah. know, there, there were a lot of people that still uh, needed to meet him. But it's interesting that you pointed out that you know football should reign supreme. But you start with thanking me about the basketball coverage. So you can't have it both ways. Yeah. I think USC has a uh, a storied history in several sports that they should be concerned about. It's not impossible to win national championships in multiple sports. You, you know who did? Urban Meyer and uh, Billy Donovan at yeah. Florida at the same time were winning national championships. So it's not impossible to do that. So that should be something an athletic director should – you know, wear many hats and be you know willing to, to pay attention to all the sports, not just one. Uh, even though there should be obviously extra emphasis when you have a blue blood program on a football program like USCS. Right. Uh, yeah. Real quick, uh, Sir Bear, Sir Beer Bryant, I like that name on uh, Periscope. <laughs> Peter Principal should be renamed the USC Principal, and that's completely true. Yeah, the US like you're promoted, you you where you're promoted your way up till the point you're failing what is it well, i forget what it is falling uh, upward yeah it's like the you're yeah you fail upward or whatever so yeah the peter principle certainly applies for uh usc oh, i don't know what the peter principle is apparently yeah neither do i so. oh crap sorry anyway. i didn't describe it wrong. it's okay that must um, be some it's like an old thing maybe. yeah okay boomer <laughs> you're not a boomer though ryan uh let's go to our last caller in the queue hello you're live on tunnel vision Hey guys, long time uh, member, first time caller. I got a football question, believe it or not. Oh, okay. Um, next, yeah, next year, I'm, I'm assuming here that Clay is gone and that we don't have Mike Leach as our next coach. So, air raids out the uh, air raid offense will not be what we're running. Um, my worry is that is Keaton Slovis a system quarterback? Like he's had so much success. Um, he's raw, but he's had a lot of success early on. But if we go to like a power spread or some other offense, should I be worried that he might not have the same success in a less quarterback friendly system? Uh, fight on, hire Urban Meyer. Thanks. Thanks and real quick, yeah, call. the Peter Principle is like you're promoted to your level of incompetence. That's the the, oh. the terminology. So okay. like, yeah. So you could argue that was going on there. Um, I've I've been impressed with Keen Slovis's poise. This certainly is a very quarterback friendly system, but I think. You've seen what USC's gumbo kind of stuff. If you know whoever you bring in, you're you're assuming it's going to be more of a quarterback friendly system, no matter what it is. So I, I don't I don't think I don't look at Keaton Slovis as like a system quarterback. Do you, I mean, do you feel that way or no? No, I think Keaton Slovis can make throws and anything. Now, the, each system, quote unquote, has a lot of tendencies that are similar. You know, you look at the the top programs right now, Clemson, Alabama. They're not running a true air raid, but there's a lot of air raid principles in those. And, you know, quarterbacks like that are really good can excel in any system. Now, there may be an adjustment period. You know, similar to at the beginning of the season with Washington, Jacob Eason, they decided, hey, when we go play action and he has to turn his back to the defense, he's struggling with that. We had to make some adjustments to our offense to fit someone, and that's what a good coach will do. You know, I think that the Keaton Slovis has fit really well into the system with Graham Harrell. I think those two, you know, I, I got the chance to talk to Keaton Slovis for our radio show, and just talking to him one on one a little bit, you know, before and after the interview, that he and Graham Harrell are very much alike. Yeah. You know, very similar. You know, that they give kind of, you know, it's not necessarily the same type of answer in a press conference, but they give different answers when they're speaking in a scrum versus when you bring up specific football plays. I was talking to him about the touchdown throw to Michael Pittman, and it, it, not necessarily that his eyes lit up, but like he was very much more descriptive. And that's the same thing with Graham. When you speak about an individual player, or just football, he's much more descriptive than what's the standing in the quarterback competition type of thing where it's more general, you know, what I call the TV questions when yeah. the TV crews get there and they want to ask the questions that'll make a good sound bite for the news versus more of a football specific question. And, and so I think that's why those two have worked really well together. Obviously Keaton Slova still has a lot of strides to go. He's shown a lot of positive things, but I think he could fit into any offense as well. I think he's made some throws. Some of the out route throws that he's made tell you he's got the arm strength. Yeah. You know, the the fact he told me actually uh, that the mesh route, that they the mesh concept they, they run, that he didn't throw the actual mesh route on that, which I believe is the ball to Drake London over the middle he's thrown a couple times the last few weeks um, where the linebacker is kind of trailing. Uh, 
he said he hadn't thrown that until the Arizona game. It's right. been in the playbook the entire time, but he, you know, he didn't have the confidence or didn't. So I, I think you're seeing him make strides. I think he can still be good. Now there'll still be a quarterback competition. Graham Harrell said that, you know, if he's around, then you, you know, he's already said that. Yeah, we'll have a quarterback competition, in, you know, next year as well. So we'll see where they go from here. If the offense is the same, I still think Keaton Slovis can can throw the ball. Yeah. And that's the crazy thing that the reminder of going to Arizona. Last time I was in Arizona for the Arizona Arizona U of A game, I went to go see Keaton Slovis at his high school. And the end of the game, they were at first and goal, and his team was so bad they ended on the forty five yard line. It was just it was penalties and like sacks, and it was just horrible. Oh my god! The cast of characters that he had to work with was just not good. Obviously, not the level of USC talent. So the the amount of stuff that has been placed on his shoulders in less than a year is just pretty insane. So you, sometimes you got to remember this kid is is a freshman. And there's yeah. a large learning curve, even when you weren't named the starting quarterback, and that kind of gets thrust on you in that sense. So. And having Kurt Warner as your high school coach certainly helped him, I think. True. Was, uh, yes, for really sure. Um, but thanks for the call, a nameless caller. Tell us your name. And, uh, we like to know the names yeah. of the people who call, especially if you're a longtime watcher. Um, but let's, believe it or not, we're 42 minutes into the show already. Oh, what happened? Lots to talk about tonight, okay. apparently. Uh, let's just go into questions, maybe rapid fire already. Yeah, Not let's sure. just we'll rapid see. fire. Uh, Jasper Smith said, how did the players react to the hire? So we haven't actually been able to talk to the players since uh, uh, the hire was announced. Uh, Close practice today, so we'll get a better sense of that uh, going forward. Yeah, I saw Connor or Murphy, but it was before the announcement. He seemed in good spirits, and uh, yeah, but I don't know. We, I didn't talk to him about it. I just said hello, but you know, <laughs> the the couple players and staff members that I've either texted with or saw on campus on the way out didn't really know much about it. You know, they were like, oh, is it is it the guy we kind of heard about a little bit? I was like, the Cincinnati guy. They're like, yeah, I think that's it. Like so, I think it's it's still a wait and see. You know, as well as Clay Helton is meeting, he you know that's one of the things that Bone did say is that he wants to you know listen and learn from the student athletes as well as the former players, you know, well as everyone else around. But I think he wants to get to know. Really, the only person that will have had an interaction with him is Hufanga because he was on the search committee. Yeah. Yeah. Um, now, and he was talking about a player being injured. He, you know, one of the student athletes, when he came in, he was talking about an injured player. It was uh, Solomon Tuiala Pupu. Oh, okay. Yeah. Was it interesting? Because yeah. I saw him near McLean when I walked in. So yeah, I so Solomon, sure. it was an injured player, and he was so excited and stuff. So he talked about him in the press conference. But yeah, it was Solomon Tuiala Pupu. And he, and he came away, like, really positive just from that interaction as far as Mike Bone did with the student athletes that USC has. So you know, I, I think that they're, that they're going to get to know him as – as things unfold in the next couple of weeks, you know, on campus and stuff, he seems like a guy. And especially if you look at his Twitter feed today, he's making the rounds he's on campus. Everywhere. It's crazy. You know, Tommy Trojan and, you know, security guards and uh, on the <laughs> band practice. So I think he's going to make his way around. He'll stop by practice and he seems like a very personable guy. So he's going to be trying to chat up these guys and, and get their opinions. And if he, if he holds true to what he said, then he's going to be listening to what they have to say and they'll get to know him, you know, over the next couple of weeks, I would say. Yeah. And that's a feature of having someone from the outside come in. They get to do those things like tour Tommy Trojan and the band and that stuff. That's new for them yeah. rather than old news. Uh, we have a question from, yes, Rocco? I was just wondering if Lynn Swan was just touring where the golf team played. Yeah, he, he went right there. He Spice. went to the golf simulator. And, Spice, and, yeah. guys. Um, Mr. Paula says, I heard that Bone's track record of success is very thin at best. Did we just settle on this guy because we couldn't or wouldn't get someone with a better record? No, no, I disagree with that. I mean, I think he's done some good things at Colorado. There was definitely some, there were, you know, it was up and down. There's some failures there. But at Cincinnati, all the reviews, I mean, just, you know, he got rave reviews from a lot of the people we talked to. Uh, they love the stadium. It was a, it's a stadium that's older than, was it Nippert Stadium that's older than the Coliseum? 1915, I believe. Yeah. And uh, they did, you know, like an $80 million renovation to it. It was great. Uh, he, did, he definitely helped Colorado get into the Pac-12. Um, there, I mean, there's, I don't think the track record is poor, like you said. I mean, there's, there's, it's an up and down. They talked about some of the, the failures and stuff during the press conference today. But that's the, that's the things you learn from. So, I, no, I, I think, and especially at Cincinnati, his last job. I think the reviews coming out of there are, are very good. Mm -hmm. I've heard some mixed reviews. Yeah. Uh, you know, Nippert Stadium you speak of, I got to go check it out over the summer, I guess, for a U.S. men's soccer game. Uh, very, like you said, it's a very old stadium, but, yeah, it was pretty nice, you know, as far as just the regular stadium atmosphere and stuff. The thing is, did we just settle on this guy because we couldn't or wouldn't get someone with a better record was the question. 
I think that there were probably a lot of people that were not interested in this job because of everything that is looming sure. over that athletic yeah. department yeah. that you're coming into. It's not just that, hey, I can go in and maybe I may, you know, I can make a splash with a football hire immediately. You know, that's a potential uh, um, thing that he will have to do. But there's FBI investigations still with basketball has not been resolved. I do not believe there's still the obviously the um, academic scandal that's going on. So there's some other things that were kind of hanging over the program where you go, maybe that's not the job I want at this moment. Yeah. He was asked about that today in like the post scrum. And it's sort of like, hey, there's two FBI investigations going on. And, and you know, he had nothing to do with that, obviously, but yeah. you've walked into it. Yeah. And I think there were some other interesting candidates, like a Pat Chun from uh, Washington State, but he has a lot less experience than than uh, you know Mike Bone does. So I mean, I, but I agree. I think there's some candidates that were that were you know approached and, and didn't want to go in there, and we knew that was going to be the case because it is such a mess. I mean, mm -hmm. 25 years of football players running the athletic department instead of real administrators. And the the thing about the position of an athletic director, you're not necessarily like a coach where you're going from a North Texas to a USC because you want to progress and go higher and eventually go to the NFL. You kind of want to be at where you are and be there for a while. You don't. There's not a lot of turnover in that sense. So if you have a cushy job, you might not want to leave it for USC that that has some scandals and stuff like that where you don't really want to take on that challenge. Yeah, and you, you know, what's this? The ninth athletic director. So uh, Mike so. Garrett was there like 17 years or something. Like he was there a long time. Now, Pat Hayden and Lynn Swan were incompetent, and they weren't there very long. But usually, you don't have Clay Helton. You don't usually have a head coach for football last through three athletic directors, and that's yeah. really what Clay Helton's doing. So that's on the USC side of making these terrible hires. So you needed to go outside and try to get someone that's going to be there for the long haul and, and really change the athletic department. And I think, you know, if, if Mike Bone comes in, cleans a lot of the house, makes a lot of the changes that need to be made, make it a, a much more efficiently running athletic department, I mean, how long he stays? He stays for a decade or so, whoever, however long it is. I think if you, the athletic department is in a much better shape, then the next time you can go out and get the biggest athletic director in the country and have him come to USC. But I don't think that was going to be the case this time. For a football coach, I think you could still do that. For the athletic director, I think you kind of needed someone that wasn't going to be the super rock star because the athletic department was in such a mess. Sure. Uh, we have a question from Nick Switching Gears on YouTube that says, since Shotgun and Ryan were dismissive last time, I asked about U UCLA controlling their own destiny. What do you guys think about it? Do you think they have a good chance at Utah SC to the title game? Question mark. Uh, I don't remember being dismissive besides so the fact that I just don't think Utah was going to lose. Yeah. And I think they proved that again by going on the road to Washington. UCLA goes to Utah this week, I yeah, believe. Yeah, they're at Utah. I, yeah. don't, I, I know UCLA is playing really well right now, and it's a lot of it is due to DTR – you know, his development, because he was just throwing balls all over the place early in the season. Getting Joshua Kelly back helped them a lot, too. But I just, I, it's hard for me to see anyone going in there. That rush defense that uh, Utah has is number one in the country. They're giving up, like, I think it was 56 or 65 yards per game. Yeah, I think it's ridiculous. Yeah. Uh, and now there's some concerns about Tyler Huntley and uh, Zach Moss's health. Those guys are getting beat up a little bit. But that the defense can carry that team, and the defense is scary good. When they're not too arrogant, you know, if they weren't too arrogant against USC, they probably would have won that game too. Yeah. Now I, I like the way UCLA is playing right now. Now that the preseason is over, Chip Kelly's still doing <laughs> the, preseason. the preseason. Yeah. <laughs> he just ignores the pre. They're one and five again or whatever. Um, they're playing really good football. I'll probably pick them against USC even. But going to Salt Lake City at Rice Eccles, it's going to be tough. I mean, I think UCLA can win there, but I wouldn't give. Uh, I would. I mean. I think it's most likely that Utah is going to win that one. But yeah, they could. That would be the craziest thing for the Pac-12 is that UCLA starts off one and five and wins the Pac-12 South. I mean, it would be crazy if UCLA wins, USC wins the next couple of games, for the crosstown showdown to be you know for the Pac-12 South title. That's fun. I, you know, I kind of I'm hoping for something like that just because you rivalry games with something on the line is just. The everything, the atmosphere just ratchets up that much more. The intensity, yeah. you know, it, it's it, it it's a fun environment, and I, that's a game I would like to cover type yeah. of thing. Which Los Angeles team can back into the Pac-12 championship? Well, technically, game? that wouldn't be backing in. Well, they're pretty much are. winning their way into it. You start at one and five, you're backing in. Like, I don't yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, you were backwards, and you finally <laughs> turned things around. You're like, you did 180. You're like, where are we going? Oh, crap, we're supposed to go that. Dang it, we've walked a mile in the wrong direction. Sure. Yeah. 
That's sure. that's kind of UCLA. Uh, let's go to a Facebook question <laughs> from Alan, who says, what do you guys think about the changes to the Board of Trustees as well? So if you didn't hear about it, they're actually downsizing uh, the n- amount of uh, members on the board. Uh, Alan says, between Fult, Bone, and the BOT changes, are we about to experience an unprecedented period of competence at USC? I mean, it's, a good, it's a good sign that competence is coming. But that's, I mean, that's how bad things were, where you just, like, these really basic things like no one, what are you going to do with a board of trustees of fifty-seven people? I mean, it just—it's just dumb. That you look at your peers, compare yourself to your peers. Was anyone else uh, hiring former football players to be the athletic directors? No, no one was doing that. Did anyone have a board that was like sixty people deep? No, they were the average is about thirty-two. They're going to cut it down to thirty-two. Just do what's right, what's normal. Stop doing things like a USC way and do it the more competent way. So yeah, that's a very good sign. Mm-hmm. Uh, we have a question from Jasper Smith who says, who's coming back from injury this week? Uh, looks like uh, Drake Jackson and Talano Hufunga will be back. S- surprisingly, Stephen Carr is a game-time decision. To me, he doesn't look like he'll be ready to go. That yeah. hamstring still kind of looked like uh, it was bothering him a little bit. A little bit, And then we got word that Hunter Eccles is out for the rest of the season. That shoulder injury uh, nagged him there, so he will elect to get a season-ending surgery. And then there's someone – oh, Max Williams. Max Williams is also yeah. out for the season. In unison. Well done. Sorry. Uh, he, he's out for the rest of the year with a foot injury. We saw that happen at practice. He, he was carted off the field while we were waiting to go back into Howard Jones. So bad news there. But the good news for Williams in that sense is that he's only played four games, so he does get to redshirt uh, and keep that eligibility there. Uh, so those are those who are coming back this week also greg johnson is going to be out he had a concussion in the last game the second one of the season so he's in concussion protocol which leaves the depth at nickelback and uh, a big concern do you move chase williams back there you know they they had said in that notre dame game when uh when greg johnson went out with a shoulder injury that they wanted to leave chase at one position so that's why we saw Kalana mccalla there when max williams was suspended so uh, will we see Kalana back? Will you see Chase Williams? How do you kind of work it around there? Because Talano Hufunga is back, you do have that option, though, yeah. which is great to see Talano back because yeah. Yeah. when he went down, it looked like it was he was Another. probably done for the yeah. season, the way he kind of crumpled over and didn't, uh, didn't get back up really quickly. So good to see some guys getting back, but again, the injury bug is still prevalent for USC. Uh, Stephen Carr, though, he, he told me after the game he would be ready to go. This week, but so (laughs) we'll see if that's actually true. You know, some players oftentimes think they're ready sooner than the doctors will allow them to be ready. They're not often the the best gauge of when they're coming back. But yeah. he, he did say that he expected to be back this week. We'll see if that actually holds up. You know, getting having Rector back last week and now getting Drake Jackson back on the other side just kind of changes the dynamic of that front for USC because you can play two true defensive ends if you want. They have not had a snap with uh, before this past week getting Christian Rector back the, the previous weeks, they did not have a snap where they had four down linemen. You know, the last two games wow. prior to Oregon. Now, Caleb Tremblay started on the opposite side of Christian Rector, so you got that back this past week against Oregon. And it was important to have that with the running attack that Oregon has. And USC stuffed the run early. Yeah. You know, they were doing really well against that. Um, but I think it just adds a different element when you have multiple guys. Now, now you lose, though, a little bit of speed with Hunter Eccles being gone, so you don't have that option as much. Did get Abdul Malik McLean back last week. I don't know if anybody noticed that during the game. He was in on their pass rush unit as well with Hunter Eccles, and they actually moved in uh, Christian Rector and Caleb Tremblay to the defensive tackle positions. So they did some different things there to try to get pass rushers on the field. We'll see if they change that up or continue with it. You know, A guy like Connor Murphy could also be coming off the edge, but getting Drake Jackson back is a big one. Yeah. You know, him and Talano Hufunga, because those are stars at two different levels of the defense. Yep. Real, real quick on the, the nickelback. So, yes, Clay Hill did make a comment on that today. So, was it Kalana Makawa? Is, right? is that yes. Kalana, yeah. yes. Okay, yeah, so I remember we covered him at the uh, Poly Bowl. So, looks like he would be first up. But then Adonis Ote was another guy he mentioned. And then also uh, Chase Williams. So, yep. there's. So he's kind of like the third option, but Clay Helton said they have you know three three bodies there, but that's that looks like the rotation they would use or the the, the hierarchy of what it would be. I think the question comes down to whether Chase moves. I think that's what it yeah. really ultimately yeah. comes down to, and part of that will be is Talanoa one hundred percent? Is he you know can you throw him in there for the full allotment? You know, one of the things Taylor Mays actually said is that. I think it was Taylor. Maybe it's been a former player, so let me not put it on Taylor. But a former player told me, uh, I can't remember exactly who right now, but that safeties probably shouldn't be playing as many plays as some of these safeties are. 
You know, because those guys are out there playing. Isaiah Paul Mal was averaging over 80 plays early in the season. And said so safeties just can't – with the hits that you're required as a safety coming downhill and the impact, it's probably not best to have guys playing 80 snaps. It's better to probably have a rotation, giving guys off, and also getting young guys experience. Getting a guy like Chase Williams, if you can rotate those three guys there, Isaiah Paul Mal, Chase Williams, and Talanoa Hufunga, and all three of them, you know, get – 60, 55 snaps rather than two of them getting 80, I think it's much better for their bodies and you know gives you that extra option when a guy does get injured. Um, so just it has to be seen how much Talanoa can play and then where Chase Williams fits in. But that will be big given just that you got to stop Jaden Daniels, you got to stop Eno Benjamin and uh, ASU's wide receiver uh, Brandon Ayuk, I believe. Mm -hmm. uh, Chad K was saying that we need to stop two and three, which is Brandon and Eno. So interesting things there. I've been told by our intern Micah that I need to apologize to Jeff from Bakersfield, who had gold questions, but he was dropped on the line. So sorry, Jeff, that wasn't our fault. It was a technical difficulty. If you want to call uh, back in, sorry, Jeff. you can take your questions. Uh, Greg Miller said, do you think Bone will fire Helton if they lose to Arizona State? I think that's a possibility. So, I mean, you'd have a, a couple days on the job. You guys don't one. think so? You'd have one day. He starts on Monday. He's oh. back in Cincinnati this weekend. Yeah, but he's there. He knows what's going on. Um, I just think because he's not going to be at the game, I think that makes it more difficult to an extent. You know, if he was there and he sees it firsthand, and you because then you can get a, the vibe of the sideline or the player or have the players quit. You know, like the, it seemed like they had last week. I think those type of things would play into a decision. I think it makes it that much more difficult when you're not there for a game. Yeah, sure. We'll see. Uh, David bring on Facebook brings up a good point just about Urban Meyer and all the talk about him. One, it's a two-way street as far as interest goes. And he says, I'm curious, has everyone forgotten that Urban has a health condition, which means he shouldn't be in a stressful situation such as a coaching job? I mean, do we even know at this point? Again, there's not an opening. But the level of interest on Meyer's part. Right, no. And that's what I said in the piece where you have to just go all in and, and put every all on the table. Make him say no. Uh, you know, listening to his, listening to his interviews, he wants to get back into coaching. It sounds like to me. Now, maybe his family doesn't want him to. Maybe his health won't allow him to. We don't know that at this point. But there's only going to be so many jobs he would be interested in. USC is one of those. He he would love to win a national championship at a third place, and you can do that at USC. So you basically have to go in there. No, you know, if USC tries and he says no, that's fine. But you got to at least try. USC has not tried to get the big fish for years and years. They just haven't done that. The last like championship coach that they've hired was in 1925, uh, Howard Jones. Like the, the last time they went outside the program to get someone who has championship experience. So this would be a big step. If he can't do it for health reasons or uh, he loves his TV gig and he wants to stay doing it at Fox and he thinks it's, that's best for him or he wants to be closer to his family in Columbus all the time, that's fine. But you at least make a run at him. And I, that's all I'm asking USC to do. And, and that kind of applies to other sports as well. It's just not been the USC way to go out and say, if we want to be really good in men's basketball, let's look at the Kansas or the North Carolina coaches and try to hire somebody away. They did try to get Rick Majerus, and obviously he backed out of it. But besides that, in the major sports, it just hasn't been the case. I mean, you look at baseball after Rod Dato, you know, he was the, you know, the greatest head coach in college baseball history. Mike Gillespie was already on staff, had played at USC, so he was a USC guy. And then after that, the names are not the top end guys. That's just not something they've done in their history. So, you know, in any sport, it would be different for them to go out and search for some people. And I think that, you know, he brought Mike Bone brought up recruiting in in uh, um, in his press conference. He was talking about kind of closing off Southern California is what he made it sound like. I think when you realize that USC doesn't always recruit itself, I think that tells you to an extent that, hey, we actually do have to go out and get good quality coaches, yeah. high-end coaches, rather than just saying, well, USC recruits itself. If we get if we get guys in here that can do whatever, then you know USC will be fine in sports. Yeah. yeah. USC's recruiting class is number 10 in the Pac-12 right now. I think number 66 in the country. I've been covering USC since 1996. This is the worst recruiting class I've ever seen. Nothing's been even close. It's It's so bad right now. And you need someone to come in. And this was kind of happening the, in the late 90s where the Florida States, they were really good. And the Texases and the Ohio States, they were getting the best players in, in Southern California. Clemson, Alabama, LSU, Georgia, they're coming in and getting those players now because USC is this wounded animal. You need to get someone 
like a powerful coach like an Urban Meyer who can do what Pete Carroll did and protect California. And actually, it helps the entire Pac-12 because you make it cool to stay in California. It's Now it's cool to leave because there's nothing really good here. You're a good, you make it a good option. And then some of those players that don't end up at USC might go to Oregon or Washington or UCLA or whatever. And you make it better for the entire Pac-12. So USC being so far down, as down as we've ever seen in recruiting, it's not just bad for the Chargers, it's bad for the entire Pac-12. And you need a powerful coach, Urban Meyer, whoever, someone to come in and, and fix that problem. Now, UCLA was even worse than USC in the rankings about a month and a half ago, about well, six weeks ago. In the last five weeks, they've gotten nine commitments. They've gotten five this week Crazy. alone. Uh, so they are all... They're taking advantage of USC being down to... To an extent, I mean, the, some of the... Not a lot of head-on battles Cross necessarily area. there. Logan Loya was one Bosco receiver that USC had an offer to, but they're up to number 33. So it tells you how quickly you can move up if you get some momentum. And now, not saying that all their commitments are just based on them playing a little bit better now, but when recruits start seeing stability and seeing development, and they go, wow, they're playing much better than they were previously... Oh, it looks like Chip Kelly's moving things in the right direction. That's when they start going, that's a school I'll really consider. And that's been one of the biggest things with Southern California kids is looking for that development and that stability. And there's still big question marks around the USC program with Clay Helton's future, obviously, but big with development. You know, yeah. There just hasn't been the level of development that there's been at some of those big-time programs. So if you want to get the Justin Flows and you know the, the Bryce Youngs of the world, you got to show them that you can develop them to be an NFL player because that's what they think they are. Yeah. Uh, to get us back on to the game that USC is playing on Saturday, Jeff on Facebook asked, is Dominic Davis going to get a carry this week? And I was told that he will not play uh, against ASU because he's still in concussion protocol, which means USC's running back core is essentially Keenan Kristen and uh, uh, Quincy Junty. And then if you want to include Amon Ross St. Brown or maybe Valus Jones in that, but uh, ASU has this 22nd uh, ranked uh, rush defense in the nation just seems like that's just not going to be a viable option uh, part of USC's offense against ASU are we expecting more five wide more putting a uh, Amon Ra in that kind of zoo formation using him as a, a wide uh, running back what do you expect from this Trojans offense now that we know that it's essentially going to be the same thing that we've seen the last two weeks yeah, unless Stephen Carr comes back and, and, sure, and adds yeah, to it but we when we've seen the, you know, the last couple of weeks when they've had the three the three main running backs injured They've just thrown the ball more. There's been more. There's just it's it. It was pretty balanced heading into those first seven games, but the last two, they've they've thrown the ball a lot more than they've run it. So I think you're going to see more of that. Like you mentioned, ASU's got a really good uh, run defense. Um, you know, it, it, and I think you're not you're just not going to see much from USC in the run game. And you know, they asked. Uh, you know, last game, Keaton Slovis threw the ball 57 times. It was a USC record. So I'm not saying he's going to go there, but. I think that's where this is trending if you don't have as many healthy running backs. What was the previous record? 55 by Todd Morenovich. So he would have only tied the record because two of those were the pop passes. I hate that they count that as as a pass where it's it's not oh, even, like a, little, it's like not even a shovel pass where you throw it forward. It's just you catch it and you do this. There's no drop back. So like on my charting and stuff, which I'll have participation stuff out for you guys tomorrow if you're a subscriber on the P, but I don't I don't count I count those as runs. You know, because the, the quarterback is not dropping back. I do rushes versus dropbacks. Okay. So, you know, I count sacks as dropbacks, too. I don't know why college football insist on sacks being part of the rushing yards. That's dumb, too. But the pop pass, like that, you do this, that's not a pass. It's not a pass. All that's right. that's a handoff in the air. To the stats guys, it's a pass. <laughs> but, yeah. Real, we'll real quick, uh, JB yes, SOL 99 on Periscope. Ryan, I'm impressed with Mike Bowen already. But is his quote jaw set with a smile? <laughs> Funny. I don't know Funny if his jaw stuff. is set. Yeah, thanks for the If anyone doesn't get that reference, that's a Clay Helton uh, staple. Yeah. Uh, guys, I think it's time for predictions. I'm wrapping us up. Yeah, we got to wrap it up. We have a lot to do still tonight. Uh, how do you think this one's going to go on Saturday? Uh, yeah, I think, uh, so ASU, the last couple of games have been blowouts. I mean, it was a 10-point game to UCLA, but they were down by like, 20 something or whatever and they came back um on, on the two road games that were really tough for asu and really they've been in every every you know game this year they've been in it's always been close they're really good at winning close games it's sort of that nfl model from herd members they stop the run they give up some passing yards but they don't give up a lot of points and uh they they get you know timely drives Jaden daniels 
doesn't have the greatest game all the time, but he can make plays happen. And when you need a you know a clutch drive, he's able to deliver. So I think it's going to be one of those close ones. I wouldn't be surprised at anything that happens, but I think I'm going to go 28-27. ASU squeaks out just about a little bit. Wow, a close one, Ryan. Yeah. I got the reverse jail Mary. I said, said it in my previous prediction, but I think Michael Pittman's coming down the Hail Mary pass to win it all. All right. So wow. that, that would be big. We've seen some Hail Marys from ASU in the past. Yeah, the twice in the last six years, seven years. Yeah. So, you know, a couple of years ago when USC was at ASU, there was the Hail Mary right before halftime, which was most notable because he was called down on the field and then they changed it and the teams had to come back out of the locker room to kick oh, the extra point. Yeah, that was weird. I remember that. <laughs> yep. That um, was a very strange one. What I say? I said 24 21 ASU. I just, I'm not feeling. Keely, you're a hater. I mean, apparently so. Uh, I'm, I'm not feeling the USC win. I don't know why. This one's like a, I think it's a one point spread or something. It's like almost a pick em, I believe. Uh, yeah. If, uh, to yeah, be I mean. fair, I said USC was going to win against Oregon. So it looked like it in the beginning, but. No. Um, th here's the thing, too. Like, what, if you watch Colorado play the last month or so, like, they've pretty much been garbage, except when they played USC. And that was a similar thing where they were on the road. Didn't look very good, but they came home and like LaVisca Chenault was healthy and Steven Montez like, you know, was good for a little while. He's not been good most of the time. And they kind of found their groove and, you know, probably should have beat USC uh, that day in Boulder. I kind of get the feeling too that ASU hadn't played well the last couple of weeks, but they had the bye. They're going home. And I, I've, you know, they're pretty healthy right now. They don't really have any kind of uh, injury concerns. So it's sort of lining up to me like they're going to play a pretty good game. And if they do... I don't see USC blowing them out, so it'll be close. And then that's why I think, you know, ASU, Herm Edwards is just really good at winning the close games. And I think USC probably makes a late mistake and ASU takes advantage. Yeah. I mean, USC struggled on the road, struggled in day games. I feel like they're a little sluggish when they have to wake up early and do all that that deal. So it'll what, be Yeah, what were the day games? So it was BYU, BYU Washington. I think, yeah. Washington, yeah. It's did, just, it's did they win either vibe. one? Of those? They didn't win either one. No, they that. did not. Ryan, a snarky one. No, but I, li I like the the call you had with the day games. That's well, true. Thank yeah. you. I think I think it matters. Um, but any final thoughts, guys? A lot a lot of things are happening in the state of Troy. Uh, new new era, if you will. Yeah. Okay. So we can be pretty snarky. I can be pretty snarky. Sometimes Keely would tell me to be less snarky. Things that have happened today are putting this USC athletic department. That you're going in the right direction so b there's some pot there's light at the end of the tunnel positive things are happening i think it you kind of had to hit rock bottom you, you know you couldn't hire a fourth football player in a row like it just got to the point where stop hiring people that aren't good at their jobs or haven't done their jobs before and you get a new president coming in there's been all these scandals and it's sort of like a slap in the face you're like this is the way it has to go go out and do things the way your peers would do them, and it looks like USC is doing that. So it, I think it's positive. Things are going to go in the right direction. So you're a USC football fan. Hang on. I think they're, they're, like I said, light at the end of the tunnel. Some positives today. But I'm going into rapid fire. Okay. Okay. Well, I thought we were ending. Was no, we're, we're going ending, quick rapid fire. Man. Hey, how, how about recruit great O-line so you could run the ball and take the pressure off your young DBs? Great call, Jasper. You do need to recruit good uh, O line, but you got to develop them once you get them on campus. That's something that's been mm -hmm. an issue at USC. Question: What's the chance SNS, who's very upset that a lot of his questions haven't been answered, he said these are great questions. I'm sorry. SNS. What are the chances USC gets Steelers head coach or Mike Leach? That's probably why your question wasn't asked. We're gonna skip that. Slam. That's why. Dennis no, Campbell, no. Ryan, what's the chance USC switch over to Jordan Brand because both North Carolina and Cincinnati were both Jordan Brand schools. They've got a contract with Nike. Yeah, so and it's a bad contract. Mm -hmm. The Cincinnati contract for, I think they have Under Armour, is the same. Apparently it's like, they have Jordan Brand. Oh, Cincinnati does? Well, whatever. It's, it's $5 million a year. That's exactly what USC gets. So Cincinnati and USC have the same money for it, for uh, apparel. That's terrible on Jasper, USC side. Jasper, any truth to the staff trying to re preserve Keenan Kristen's red shirt? Yes, that's their hope uh, that he plays this week, and then they get guys back next week. Beck? Will will Bond hire a, a coach from uh, Will Bone hire a coach from Eastern Kentucky or North Texas? Maybe you know there are twenty one sports at USC. Heather but Ryan, not for football. Ryan, if USC can win out, would Helton stay? No. Torian, question: Will we have more recruiting personnel staff like the other blue blood programs? Should be. That'll yes. be a good question. Yeah. On you know, money if you get a guy like Urban, end. yes, like. <laughs> 
You yes. Investment of resources. We'll see how that happens. SNS says you literally picked my dumpiest question. Well, I got one more <laughs> well, for you. Don't the ask end. them. <laughs> Trek uh, Carr hasn't survived any season without injury. Need to bring in another back next season. Yes, they do need to bring in another back just because you've seen what happens with running backs. They always get hurt. Yeah. Beck, who is the better? Who is better at their job? Clay or Pac-12 refs? Clay, and that tells you a lot about how bad the Pac-12 refs are. <laughs> Ooh. Pac-12 okay. refs. Pac-12 refs are got uh, awful. They are. Yes. Uh, Heather, if they fire Clay, what happens to our existing players? Do they transfer? I'm not going to answer it as a hypothetical question. However, that is a concern, especially now with the transfer portal. If coaches are fired, teams have to watch out for a lot of transfers. Right. Potential. And, but if you listen to that podcast, the first thing Urban Meyer does when he walks into the new places, like and to, like when he takes over a job, he says, "I know, you know, none of you guys picked me, but I picked you." And that's what he's going to do. He's going to go in there and try to keep everybody happy. And then some guys might want to transfer out. But, like, that's what a new coach would do. So if you hire a really good coach, I don't think the transfer portal is going to come into, you know, unless there's guys that, like, just – they were starters before, but they're not going to play anymore, stuff like that. How many times has he had a new job with the transfer portal? No, he hasn't had that. But. Exactly. True. And Damn. last one, SNS. Why does Ryan always talk USC down when he's on the podcast of champions? Michael Pittman is better than the wide receiver at Oregon State. Ryan, you know it. I know it. Everybody knows it. Question, 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 question mark. <laughs> uh, I mean, they're they're really good. I mean, they're they're both really good. I mean, I don't Isaiah know. Hodgins is who yeah. we're talking about? Yeah. I mean, I if you're talking about the NFL draft, I think Isaiah Hodgins goes before Michael Pittman, but that's just my opinion. I don't know. I haven't looked at any draft boards or anything, but Pittman's a beast. He's a beast, yeah. He is a beast. Yeah. For love, sure. And love watching him on special teams, too. Something to watch for because his foot was taped. His left foot was taped during practice yeah. on Wednesday, and he wasn't dressed out. He's doing some individual drills, but something to watch for, for sure. He'll be good to go. I, You know, I at this point, you I'm never saying know. It. I'm saying it. The, I think he'll play. I think he, he's a fighter in that sense, but how much can they get out of him? We shall see. Keely, what did you say before that it was going to be all hands on deck or something for this one? Oh, or? Clay Helton said when he was asked about injuries and just like game planning with not a lot of running backs, he said we're pretty much throwing everything but the kitchen sink at the game plan this week. So I think it's just kind of another survive in advance in that sense in, in the coaches' minds. I You're, think they're really fighting to be bowl eligible, to be honest. I, I think they are, but I, you get the feeling that those guys might come out and like does Drake Jackson play like the first quarter and then he's got to come out of the game or, you know, or Talanoa Funga and then he's got like you might see that guys play early and then they're not able to play anymore that that would be a, a bummer for those guys but you you might see something like that if they're coming back from injury just to try and become bowl eligible hopefully they don't porter gust in anyone and yeah play that was way bad. too much when yeah. they come back from an injury that was at asu though i remember talking True. to him after the game two years ago crazy yep, yep. and my head is the rockies just yeah so. i was about to say that um already any final thoughts i'm scared to ask that we might go longer but any final i got thoughts, some guys? rapid fire no i'm just kidding uh no great thanks for everyone for uh showing up and coming in we got the <laughs> um you know watching us and all the stuff here we you know the we all the press conference all. stuff yeah there's tons of coverage up on uscfootball.com from that uh tomorrow night friday night at midnight kabc our live peristyle pregame show we recorded a lot of it today. And, and if you're watching on YouTube, please drop us a subscribe. We are 40 away from 10,000. Yeah, we I'm need to get 10,000 on YouTube. If you could. That Instagram too. Out. Go to Instagram at the Peristyle. Please subscribe Close there. We're trying to get the 10,000 also. So that'd be awesome. Super helpful. Yeah. So thanks, but, guys. And last thing for me, if you're not traveling to Arizona this weekend, then check out the basketball team on Friday. Looked really fun. They were really fun to watch on, or in their opener on Tuesday. Nick Kongu is a beast. A beast. Ah, check Tied it the out. school record. For blocks in his first career game. Are they have like 15 freshmen on the team or something? Five. Five. And then Drake, Je Drake London, when he comes over, will be the sixth. Nice. Fun. That's fun. He was on the bench, by the way. Oh, cool. Interesting. Alrighty. That's going to wrap it up. We'll be back on Sunday to break out all down what happened in Arizona. Uh, did USC come out with a win? We shall see. 7 p.m. Uh, we'll have the latest right here. notes right here. Uh, it'll be fun. Join us. Uh, that's Ryan. That's Shotgun. I'm Keely. We'll see y'all on Sunday. Bye. See ya.